Hello, everyone. Welcome to our live session. I will be going over a quick startup presentation to welcome you all and introduce you to our program and the various opportunities if you have not attended our sessions previously. So Pre-Health Shadowing is a student-led, minority-led, women-led nonprofit dedicating to helping prospective healthcare professionals gain access to educational resources, no matter their demographic, status, abilities, or location. My name is Muntaha. I am the Editor-in-Chief here at Pre-Health Shadowing, and I thank you for attending our session today, and let's get started. Just a little PSA. We do have closed captioning for all of our sessions to accommodate our students. This setting is available on the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you need any assistance enabling the transcripts, please direct message one of our team members. We are always happy to help you if you need any help with that. We are always looking for ways to be more inclusive and ensure our sessions are accessible to everyone. So please, if you have any recommendations, um, of how we can improve, you can email us at info at freehealthshadowing.com. So since this is an international program, we want to know where everyone is Zooming from. Please drop your location in the chat. I'm Zooming from Florida. Wow, we have students from all over the country. That's so exciting and a couple from Florida. So if you want to stay in the loop, follow us on our social media. We are active on Instagram and TikTok. And if you'd like to know about our sessions coming up, please sign up for our email list on our website so you never miss a session. We have some wonderful opportunities for you all as benefits for being part of the program. We have partnered with Kaplan to get our students a 10% discount code that can be used on all Kaplan products as well as free resources such as study guides to help prepare you for the standardized tests like the MCAT, NCLEX, GRE, PCAT. So if you fill out our short survey in the chat, you will get signed up for these deals for absolutely free. We would also like to draw your attention to another amazing program called Neolith. So Neolith is an online mental health platform for students and Free health professionals, especially, we have a lot of stress and the path isn't easy. So we've partnered with Neolith to spread the word about mental health and offer free access to their mental health services. If you use the link in the chat and enter the code free health when signing up, you will have access to Neolith services. Mask for Mask is an amazing women-led organization that donates four masks for every four masks sold. These go to people in need during the COVID-19 pandemic. So think of those people who are in the homeless community, healthcare workers without proper PPE, and educators and other people who are struggling to stay safe. With our discount code PHS15, you can get 15% off your order if you buy through this method. Free Health Shadowing will also get 10% off the proceeds, which is amazing because you're going to get masks help out people who need masks and also benefit the nonprofit Pre-Health Shadowing. If you want to play a bigger part in supporting PHS, we would love for you to join our network of student volunteers and team members. You can apply to be part of our administrative team and lead students in various projects, initiatives with pro professional outreach, grant writing, and so much more. We understand that as a Pre-Health student, you may not have the time, so we offer some opportunities to volunteer asynchronously, which can be done with the link in the chat. So if you are a high school student and want to get involved, we have started a program called HTP, which means high school training for PHS, which allows you to connect with college help pre health programs and get involved with fundraising for PHS and organize resources for high school students. We want to recognize your hard work. So if you'd like to write any articles, reflections, and reviews of our live sessions, please visit the link in our chat and you can definitely submit some of your work. This will look great on CVs, applications, and resumes. And as the editor-in-chief, I look forward to reading your work. As part of our mission at PHS, we'd like to promote diversity. And in order to do this, we've launched an initiative to have monthly panels. If you have anyone like a professor or a mentor that you think would uh, have great contributions to our monthly panels concerning diversity and the COVID-19 roundtable, please nominate them using today using the link in the chat. 
We humbly ask that you donate to our program. As you know, pre-health shadowing is completely student run and we really do need funding to uh, support our website and our Zoom and other programs that we have. So if you are not financially able to, we request you send this link to someone else. Otherwise, please spread the word about pre-health shadowing so we have as many students as possible joining our sessions. Throughout the session today, we encourage you to drop any questions in the chat. We will have a 30 minute Q&A with our professional with all of your questions. Make sure to take good notes because we will be having a post shadowing assessment in which you can verify your hours. Uh, the post shadowing assessment will be based on the presentation today and taking good notes is good for documenting your experiences and thoughts during the presentation. Lastly, we request that you have your cameras on during a time where we have to socially distance. It just makes us feel a little bit closer. So if you are able to, please turn your cameras on. We appreciate you for listening. And now I would like to welcome our professional, Dr. Tanis. Thank you so much for being here today. You may uh, start presenting whenever you're ready. All right. All right. See one second, guys. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can see it. All right, let me know if any issues with the volume and then. For the students listening in, I'm really excited to be here and uh, share my uh, my medical tract experience with all of you. And if you have any questions that you think are timely questions, please don't hesitate to, to shoot them out. Otherwise, uh, I think we'll try to go through all the questions at the end uh, through the list of questions that gets generated. So I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon. I'm based out of Washington, DC. I'm at uh, Georgetown University and I practice at uh, MedStar Washington Hospital Center. And I have no disclosures that are related to this talk. So a little bit about my tract and sort of how I grew up and how I ended up here uh, at this stage of my life. I'm 37 years old. I uh, was born in the US, but grew up in Lebanon, moved back to the US at the age of seven. My uh, dad was in the World Bank. And so we, we traveled around quite a bit growing up. I actually grew up trilingual. English was my third language and learned English when I moved to the U.S. at the age of seven. And then while I was in high school and then after high school, picked up Spanish and since have become um, pretty conversational, borderline fluent Spanish, which uh, has been uh, probably the most beneficial out of my non-English languages in terms of communicating with people in general and definitely with these here in the U.S. Um, I had a bridge to the American public school system and continued there until I got to college. So in terms of my background um, education wise, I was always more interested in math and science. It always just was easier for me and had a passion for it. Also, I excelled at it. I was pretty mediocre at subjects like English, reading comprehension. Um, I just wasn't that great at it. I wasn't bad, but I just wasn't that great at it compared to the math and sciences. So Medicine for me was a very natural uh, pathway, uh, but I also had a very strong interest in it as well. Uh, was very athletic growing up. Tennis was my main sport. And uh, I was lucky in the sense that I knew really early on in life that I wanted to be a physician. And the key word here is I wanted to be a physician. It wasn't something I did for my parents. It wasn't something that I did because I thought it was the right thing to do. When I was 12 years old, I was able to shadow a surgeon in the operating room and it was like love at first sight like i just i just knew that that was sort of the career that i wanted to um, pursue and over the years my interest continued to kind of strengthen that uh there I went to emory university this was 2001 to 2005 i spent four years there I majored uh, in neuroscience and behavioral biology. At the time, it was a pretty new major. The neuroscience, anthropology, and psychology. So it was a very cool, it was just a fun major. Uh, extracurriculars, I was in a fraternity. And I'd say the biggest thing I learned with that was just how to socialize with people, how to be friendly, how to shake hands, how to start a conversation and not be awkward. 
So I learned a lot of really important soft skills that helped me throughout the interview process down the road. And I uh, got involved with summer research, uh, tried to get as many extracurriculars as I could through that. Um, I did things like spring break, spring break mission trips that helped expand my horizons and then uh, spent a lot of time shadowing any kind of doctor that I could try to shadow at the time. I would spend a day, two days, three days, really any, any opportunity that I had to get in the clinic, uh, in the hospital, in the operating room, uh, I took those opportunities. So just out of curiosity, just to pull the group, um, I'm curious to know out of this group right now that's listening in, how many are traditional in the sense that they're majoring or plan to major in a science, meaning chemistry, biology, uh, physics, et cetera. And then how many are planning to major or have majored in a non-science? So English, uh, literature, art history, et cetera. Um, is there a way for us to get the poll now during the presentation or is this something that we'll find out later? Um, we do have some students answering in the chat. So going off of that, I think we have a majority science majors and some non-science, but most okay. people are in science. Right, so, so really interesting and, and, and we'll get to that. And one thing I forgot to mention, I, I was on the admissions committee at the University of Maryland when I was a med student there. I actually sat on the committee for one year and then spent three years uh, interviewing prospective medical students. So I have a very interesting take on the traditional uh, pre-med tract. So for me personally, and again, it's always easier once you get to the destination to look back and say, I would have done things differently. It's always, it's a little bit harder when you're actually in the trenches and trying to get to that destination that you're going after. But for me, as much as I love neuroscience and I had a fantastic experience and I did well, if I can go back to college, I would probably major in art history, still take my pre-med classes, and then plan to go to medical school. And the reason is, is that you're always gonna be learning about science. You're always gonna be in a class where you're gonna learn about neurons and transmitters and uh, biochem and Krebs cycle, et cetera. But what you will never have the opportunity to do is go back and actually learn something interesting, something that makes you a more interesting human being. Uh, so for me, my experience interviewing pre-med students was that I found that those that majored in art history, in English, in religion, and topics that are very relevant in terms of having a conversation with another person, they're the ones that tended to have a better interview experience because they were just better rounded. They had a, they had a more interesting take on life. The science majors, although obviously most of them got into medical school, it's, they were a bit more unidimensional uh, and had to rely more on their extracurriculars to kind of show themselves as different than the rest of the pack. So that was just my take and my experience. So in general, when I, when I advise pre-med students, I tell them to take the pre-med courses. Obviously you have to do very well and there's less room for error, but if you have a passion for something other than science, by all means, pursue it. That's what's gonna make you different and that's what's gonna feed your individuality. So I got to med school. Um, I actually spent five years in med school because I took one year off to do research. And at the time, my plan was to try to pivot into an MD-PhD program. Uh, now, that being said, I had a very specific plan in place. So when I took that year off, it was a very calculated year off. I spent a lot of time planning for it. And I had a very particular project in mind that I wanted to get uh, going. And I actually, in that one year, got a 700,000 DOD grant for that project. Uh, it was a very beneficial year, obviously, for uh, the reasons I just mentioned. But at the same time, it made me realize that, you know, the MD PhD track's not for me. I didn't want to be in a lab. I didn't want to take more time off and work on papers and write grants. I actually wanted to continue my path and, and, and go into the clinical uh, aspects of medicine. And I learned, I figured out early on that I wanted to go into orthopedics. And for those who are closer to medical school, you'll know orthopedics is one of the more competitive specialties. So having that year off helped with that, obviously, with getting the grant. Um, but uh, it allowed me to also just continue moving forward. It's a long track, it's a lot of training, so I wanted to keep moving forward at the time, and I do not regret that decision. That being said, if you have any inclination to be in the lab or to start a project or to get an MD, PhD, absolutely. I mean, those are, um, you know, those are very important roles to, to have in the medical community. So I'll be giving out advice throughout this presentation. And then there's another slide where I kind of go through some of my major um, uh, pearls and pitfalls. But um, 
again, if you are thinking about going to medicine, and specifically for those of you who have an inclination towards surgery, and you'll learn this again when you get to med school, but in general, the rule of thumb, if you're considering a surgical specialty versus a non-surgical specialty, in general, the rule of thumb is that if you can be happy, and the keyword here is happy, doing anything other than surgery, you should do anything other than surgery because it's a very demanding lifestyle. Uh, the training can be very rigorous. And if you don't love it, you can have a harder time going through that training. Now, that being said, um, if you are the type of person that knows in their heart that you will not be happy doing anything other than surgery, well, then now you know you're meant to be a surgeon and your training is going to be so much easier in the sense that you'll, you'll appreciate it more. You won't feel like you're always in the trenches. Uh, you won't always feel like you're burned out and you'll always feel like you're following your passion. So I started my residency. I stayed at University of Maryland uh, and at the uh, Shock Trauma Center. It was uh, a, an incredible experience for orthopedic surgery. It was a five-year program. I was able to, during my residency training, take two, two months off. In my fourth year, we had a research stent, and I got my research done early, obviously. And during that 12-week research stent, instead of sticking around the lab and not operating, I actually was able to, I applied and got a travel fellowship to go to Myanmar. And I spent uh, two months in Yangon um, operating with the orthopedic surgeons at Yangon General Hospital. It was probably one of the most interesting experiences of my life. You can see here in the image at the bottom left is actually a picture. I'm the taller guy on the left. The one to my right was the uh, spine surgery attending at Yangon General Hospital. And we were doing a thoracal lumbar dislocation. It was a patient that dislocated their spine because they fell off of a tree. And we were in the middle of surgery and all of a sudden the lights went off. It was, it very much felt like you got into a time capsule went back in time about 40 or 50 years. And you can see this picture is literally the guy standing next to us in the OR pulled out the flashlight and we had to finish the surgery with nothing but a flashlight and uh, just basic wall suction. So uh, those are the sorts of experiences you get when you travel to developing countries um, around the world and get those sorts of surgical experiences. Uh, then I continued to, after orthopedic surgery training, I went to University of California, San Diego, where I did a one-year spine surgery fellowship. And UCSD still is sort of the, at least in Southern California, it's sort of the destination for disaster spine surgery. So we did a lot of tumors, a lot of infections, a lot of trauma, a lot of revision spine cases. And that at the time was my interest and still is my interest uh, within the spine surgery realm. And it was probably the most intense year of my life. I mean, I'm not going to tell you how many hours of work, how many hours a week I worked, but it was a significant amount. And it was very common to go days where you're sleeping three or four hours. But that being said, what you'll notice that I wrote here is it was the funnest year of my life. So as intense as it was, because I loved it so much, it really was such an incredible year for me. And I have such great memories um, of my last year of training. So that being said, and I think that this advice is probably true for anybody who goes into medicine uh, and then goes into post-medical school training, but specifically those that go into a surgical subspecialty because you spend so many years in such an intense experience and environment where you feel like you are in a tunnel. Um, and this was advice that I got when I was in my first year of orthopedic surgery training. I had um, a family friend who was an orthopedic surgeon in his 40s or 50s who gave me this advice and he said, he, at the time he said, Oliver, you're going to be emotionally stunted and be prepared to be emotionally stunted. And at the time I didn't really know what that meant. I mean, I, I knew that what he was saying, he was saying that I was gonna be in such an intense environment that I wouldn't have the opportunity to grow emotionally into myself. And even though I knew it, I didn't really understand it until I really came out of residency training and fellowship training. And my experience, my experience is always a great experience. I had so much fun in college. Um, I would say med school for me was in a way continuation of college. I had a ton of fun. I loved residency. My fellowship, I told you, was one of the best years of my life. And still, I was emotionally stunted because when you're going from college to medical school, to residency, to fellowship, you're always in an environment where you feel like you're a student or you still have that mentality. You're not experiencing life the way that your friends are who go into something that's not medicine related. And when I came out of training, and it wasn't my first year, because your first year out of training, you're on your own, you're trying not to kill patients, you're in a very intense environment where you're, you're, you're trying to float and survive and, and, and be a good physician. It was, it was two years after I finished training, I woke up one day and I realized that I had worked all these years to get my profession settled, 
and it was great. I was finally where I wanted to be, but then the rest of my life had not caught up. So I literally had to go back to the building blocks and figure out what makes me happy, what kinds of friends I wanted to have. Did I still want to party the same way that I did when I was in med school and uh, in residency? Um, so it really took me about a year or so to kind of go back to those basic building blocks and in a way rebuild my happiness and get to know myself in a way that I'd never known. So the advice here is be aware, just be aware that you may have some emotional stunting, which is fine. That's part of the process, but just be aware of it. Just being mindful of it is, is, is half the battle and um, will help you a lot in your experiences and in your relationships. So post-training, I came to Georgetown University. I'm at Washington Hospital Center, which is the level one trauma center in Washington, DC. And I currently have a pretty busy spine practice. I do a lot of really invasive spine surgery, but I also do a lot of complex uh, spine surgery and building a complex spine surgery program at Washington Hospital Center. So I'm almost five years into my career and so far having a ton of fun. So a typical day for me, and I would not say this is a typical day for most surgeons who are in their uh, in, in practice. You have to understand for me, I'm not married. I don't have kids. So in a way I really can focus on the things that I really want to focus on. So my, my typical day is I wake up pretty early, but the reason I wake up to, uh, so early is to go to the gym. I go to the gym almost every day during the week from five to 6 AM and get that out of the way hospital by 7 AM. I'm in the operating room two to three days a week. And I'm in clinic a couple of days a week. Usually I'm home by five 30. That's one thing I really try to do is try to get out of the hospital by five or five 30. So I can have the evening to hang out with my family, to go out to dinners, to go on dates with my girlfriend, uh, picked up dancing actually in the last few years. And that was one of the things that I was alluding to earlier in terms of recreating your happiness and finding out what really makes you happy. Uh, I try to spend as much time with my parents. The reason I came back to DC is to be closer to my parents. And usually by 9 p.m. I'm starting to crash and uh, in bed by 9.30 so I can wake up and do it all over again. Weekends, I take call one weekend a month. And that tends to be a pretty busy weekend, but the other three or four weekends a month, I'm uh, trying to have as much fun as I can. So I'm going to go through the slide. It's, it's, it's a bunch of advice that I got over the years. And um, I hope that, you know, for those of you who are in the process of thinking about medical school or about to interview for medical school uh, or go through the process, I hope you'll at least pick up one or two tidbits from my experience at least. So the first piece of advice, and especially if you're going to interview or interview soon, the most important thing is to be honest. There's, uh, and this is also coming from someone who's interviewed a lot of uh, pre-med uh, students for medical school. There's this constant need to want to show off, right? You want to, you want to display what you've accomplished. You want to show the best version of yourself, but it's so critical to be honest. And my experience, I'll tell you, I had a very interesting experience when I was interviewing for GW med school. It was, I think my second or third interview and it was, you know, a typical interview where, you know, you don't, you don't always jive very well with your, with the person who's interviewing you, especially the first 20, 30 minutes was always like this awkward, you know, you're feeling them out there, feeling you out. And he asked me a question. He said, what was the last book that you read? And, you know, typical pre-med uh, interview uh, or, or med school interview question. And I looked at him straight in the face and I said, you know, sir, honestly, I don't really enjoy reading that much. And I was 100% sincere about that because I don't enjoy reading. And I told you that, you know, reading was not my specialty, was not my, my, uh, my, my strength. And he looked at me and all of a sudden, the entire tone of the interview changed. He saw me as someone who was candid. He respected my answer. I mean, obviously there was a part two to that answer. I said to him, well, even though I don't enjoy reading that much because I'm always outside doing something, I have to, I have to, I have to be doing something physical. I enjoy practicing tennis. Uh, I have to be doing something while I'm learning. I can't just sit there and read. And that was, that was the change of the interview. And I had a fantastic uh, interview with him. And at the end of the interview, he told me that, um, you know, he had a very uh, strong experience with me and was going to write me a very strong recommendation to go to GW. So again, just because you have a weakness on paper, it doesn't mean that it has to be a true weakness. And so I'd say be honest, because honesty is probably one of the most important traits when uh, interviewing uh, pre-med students. We've already talked about this. You don't have to major in science. Uh, my greatest regret in undergrad was not studying abroad. So again, if you don't major in science, but still do well in your pre-med courses, then you could potentially um, move your classes around where you can go six months abroad and study abroad. And I promise you, you will learn a lot about yourself. You'll grow a lot, maybe learn another language and just overall become a better rounded, more interesting person to talk to, especially on the interview trail. 
um, enjoy the journey. This might be the most important piece of advice that I can give you guys. Enjoy the journey. And um, I always enjoyed the journey, but I was also so focused on getting to the end of the tunnel. And I grew up in a, in a, in a Middle Eastern family where the message to me my entire life was delay your gratification, work hard now, get there. And then once you get there, then you'll be set. That was always the message that I got from my parents. Once you get there, then you'll be set. Well, the problem is I got there and I realized, wait a second, where's my happiness? Like, where's this really like deeply seated happiness that I thought I was going to have when I got there? And, you know, when I finally got there, I was not living paycheck to paycheck anymore. I was able to buy a decent condo. Um, I had, you know, a circle of friends, but I didn't really feel like I had my happiness. What I realized was that the happiness doesn't come at the end of the tunnel. It starts right now. Enjoy your journey. And in retrospect, as much as I enjoyed my journey, I was not mindful of that enjoyment at the time. So don't lose track of that. It's a pretty special experience. Uh, don't lose, don't lose, uh, don't lose your identity. That's important. Continue to cultivate your hobbies, your passions outside of medicine. I can't stress that enough. You really want to work on yourself as a person and not just get completely carried away with the books and the stacks and the tests, et cetera. Again, easier said than done and always easier to say retrospectively, but, uh, try to be mindful of that as much as you can. Always have a plan B and that's pretty much for everything in life. Even at this point in my life, even, um, I love my career and I hope to be operating until I'm 75 years old, but I have a plan B. And so you should always have a plan B every step of the way, because sometimes things just don't work out the way you want them to work out. And that's okay, because maybe your plan B was really meant to be. So have a plan B. That's important. Um, this one also super important. Don't get out of shape physically or mentally. So the mental part we've talked about a little bit, the physical part, for those of you who currently enjoy working out and have the time to work out, you won't have as much time to do that but you also have to do something. If it's even five or 10 minutes where you're stretching, you're going for a jog, you're doing something physical every day, it's a lot easier to stay in shape than get out of shape. And once you're out of shape, it'll start to affect you mentally, not just physically. Um, be prepared to be selfish during this journey. It's an incredible journey, but unfortunately it's a journey where you have to be a little bit selfish. Uh, I was lucky because my parents supported me. I, wasn't, I, was, I was never married, I never had any kids, so I was able to be selfish. Uh, but have the conversation with your close friends and family. Let them know what you're going to go through and let them know that this is your time where you may not be as responsive. You may not be calling as much. You may not be responding to text messages. Let them know what your needs are so they can be a better support system for you. And then we talked about this one already. So what's one piece of advice that I forgot to mention? And this is probably more of a, what am I thinking kind of question. So if you guys aren't thinking about this, this is probably the one take home message out of this entire talk. If you haven't received this advice from anybody in the past, do not go into medicine for the money. And even today, when I talk to pre-med students, usually in the first five minutes of the conversation, the, the, the topic of money comes up, which is an important topic. But if income is your primary goal, if you think that you're gonna go into medicine and be wealthy, it's wrong, do not do that. You're doing the wrong thing. So if income is your primary goal and there's nothing wrong with wanting to be a bazillionaire, nothing wrong whatsoever. But if that's your primary goal, then you're much better off going where the money is, Wall Street, real estate, crypto, investing, day trading, whatever it is, rather than going into medicine. Because the, the, the reality is that it's not what it used to be 20 or 30 years ago, you'll do fine but there are much better ways to build wealth. So I love this example. Um, I saw this a few years ago, but it was doctor versus nurse. Uh, this is an example of a doctor versus a plumber. And this is assuming the pre-med student who has a very traditional pre-med track. So you go to high school, college, straight to med school, continue to training uh, versus a plumber who comes out uh, of high school and starts working immediately. So this example uses a urologist's income. So you'll, you'll see in the next slide um, the sort of average for urologist income. And you have to keep in mind, a urologist uh, is a, a urology is a surgical subspecialty. So they tend to make a significant amount more money than primary care. So primary care physicians in 2020 averaged the salary of about uh, a quarter million dollars a year uh, versus um, surgical specialties had an average income of $345,000 a year. So if you look here at this chart, you can see a doctor who goes through um, college, makes zero income, 
uh, versus a plumber starts making some money at the age of 18, you can see that salary st starts to increase over the course of the first 10 years out uh, in, uh, in that trade. Versus a doctor's net worth, you're accruing loans. And so your net worth becomes very negative very quickly. Now, what's interesting here is at the age of 25, this doctor here has a net worth of minus $310,000. This example is assuming that the physician at the age of 26 is starting to pay off the loans in residency. I'll tell you right now, most residents don't have the opportunity to pay off their loans. They're not making that much money to be able to pay off their loans. So the reality is by the time you're done training, it's very possible you could have a net worth of mi minus $400,000 if you took out loans for college and medical school. Versus look at this, by the time a plumber is 31 years old or 32 years old, they have a net worth of almost a million dollars, okay? Now, <clears throat> Uh, when I go to the uh, next slide, you can see here the intersection point. So the point, and again, this is taking a, a, a urologic surgeon's average income. So you can see here a urologist, uh, by the time they're in their upper 30s, they're making close to half a million dollars a year. Okay, The plumber also income going up quite a bit, right? That's not a bad income. But the intersection point where the average surgical subspecialist's net worth increases above the average plumber's net worth is 41, all right? And that's being very generous. Again, that's assuming that, that, these, that these physicians are paying off their loans in residency, which most of them are not. And it's assuming that this physician is gonna go into surgical subspecialty. So imagine you go into a primary care specialty, which again, you'll do well, but you're not gonna crush it financially. Um, the intersection point is actually closer to like mid fifties. And here's a poll, MD versus RN. So the average traditional pre-med student who goes straight to straight from undergrad to college and straight from uh, sorry straight from uh, high school to undergrad undergrad to medical school and then continues the training that starts practicing maybe late 20s 28 29 30 low 30s compared to an RN who starts working at the age of 22 what do you what do you think the average intersection point is going to be for when the MD's total net worth becomes greater than the RN's total net worth 54. So at the age of 54, the average primary care physician, meaning pediatrics, primary medicine, not non-surgical subspecialty, will finally have a greater net worth than the average RN who started working at 22 at the age of 54. And that's the power of compounding. That's the power of investment. So the earlier you start working, the better off you're going to be in the long term. So again, I bring this example up because I think it's important for people to really have their priority straight and to understand that if this is something that you really are gonna wanna do because it's your passion, I promise you, you're gonna have the best career ever. I love what I do. But if, if you're doing it for the wrong reasons, you're doing it because your parents want you to do it, you're doing it because um, you, know, you wanna be a bazillionaire, you're, you're choosing the wrong reasons. You're gonna one day maybe look back and regret it or you're gonna struggle through the difficulties of training. So for me, orthopedics um, was a pretty straightforward decision. I knew I wanted to be a, sur a surgeon. Uh, I love to fix things. I love to do things with my hand. And I was always really good at studying and taking tests, but uh, I, uh, I didn't enjoy, you know, reading for long periods of time. I didn't, I didn't enjoy, um, you know, I, I had sort of, sort of a short attention span. So for me, orthopedics made a lot of sense. It's, uh, it's a very diverse field. And then lastly, lifestyle. lifestyle you can have a great lifestyle, lifestyle as, a, as a surgical subspecialist. You don't have to wake up at 4.30 in the morning like I do. Um, and then why I chose spine, I just fell in love with it when I was a resident. I found that it, they were the most interesting cases. I saw that there was a lot of need for innovation. It's a field that's changing very quickly. And then the neurologic aspect of spine surgery adds a significant amount of uh, complexity, which I really enjoyed during my training. So... Crash course in spine surgery looks like, uh, I'll try to go through this in the next 15, 20 minutes, just so we have time for um, questions at the end. And let me know if I should be going through this a little bit faster. So what a spine surgeon does. So this is the basic of what a spine surgeon does. We decompress the spinal cord when something's compressing the cord. We decompress nerves when there's something pinching on a nerve and causing um, neurologic pain. We correct major deformities like scoliosis or kyphosis. We take out tumors and infections. Uh, when they're affecting the spine, and we fix unstable spine fractures. So here's some basic anatomy. So the picture on the left shows a typical spine. Uh, you, have four, you have four major curvatures in the spine. You have cervical lordosis, thoracic kyphosis, lumbar lordosis, 
And then the sacrum is, kyph uh, is kyphose, meaning has a forward uh, curvature. And if you can see these four curves balance each other out to allow this to head to be balanced over the pelvis in an energy efficient state. That's the one thing about being a human that's very different than the rest of the animal kingdom is that we're able to live in a bipedal state, meaning on both of our legs, upright, in a very balanced and energy efficient state. Uh, the spine is made up of 33 vertebrae and the function of the spine, other than allowing us to stand upright is to protect the neural structures. This is a typical uh, spinal segment. You can see in the front of the spine, you have a disc between two vertebrae. And in the back, you have these facet joints, which are the joints uh, between the posterior elements of the spine and in between are where the nerves live and exit. And one thing that I'll teach you today about orthopedics and then spine as well, and is that the way that a joint degenerates over time. So if you look at this image here, you can see this is a relatively normal knee and this is a very arthritic knee, meaning a very degenerative knee. The first thing that happens when a joint starts to degenerate, you start to lose cartilage. When you lose cartilage, the joint in an effort to stabilize uh, itself will start to grow bone spurs at the edges of the margins of the joint. So here you can see the knee, you see these bone spurs growing around the edges to try to stabilize that joint as it degenerates. But the problem is the ligaments get thick, that hypertrophy, and then sometimes the joint can become unstable. Well, in a knee or in a hip, it can cause pain, but in the spine, because you have the nerves and the spinal cord that are traveling right through the bony structures um, and the articular structures of the spine, you'll see here that when these bone spurs grow, they'll pinch a nerve. Or when they grow here, they can pinch on the spinal cord. So that's when the spine surgeon comes in when patients are losing function or having severe pain and you have to go in and decompress uh, that area of the spine. That's probably the main thing that spine surgeons do. So this is, an, this is a full body MRI. You can see here the patient's facing to the left of the screen. You can see here the contour of the face, the front of the neck, here's the front of the chest, and here's the back of the neck, the back of the thoracic spine, and then the back of the lumbar spine. This is the bottom of the brain, here's the brain stem, and this long gray line coming all the way down through the spinal canal is the spinal cord. The spinal cord travels all the way through, ends right here at approximately the L1 level. Uh, the L1 level is the first vertebra in the lumbar spine, so L for lumbar. And you can see here, it looks like a bunch of hairs or horse's tail that are coming out of the spinal cord and traveling through the lumbar canal. And these, ner these are the nerves. These are the, these are the lumbar nerves that are exiting one at a time out of the spine to travel down the legs. And the same thing happens in the neck, but you can't see it here. The nerves exit one level at a time and then travel down the arms. Um, so some commonly treated conditions, I'll go through a couple of these. Uh, and I'll give you some, uh, some before and after examples as well. So cervical myelopathy is the first case we're gonna go through. So this is a very typical patient that I'll see in my clinic, 55 year old female, six months of progressive hand clumsiness. She's been dropping objects. She's losing her grip strength. She has numbness in her fingers. She's losing her equilibrium. She said, doc, six months ago I was walking okay. Now I need a cane because I'm losing my equilibrium. So this is a very typical picture for cervical myelopathy. And this is what her MRI looks like. You can see here, it's a sideways view of the cervical spine, meaning of the neck. And this is the bottom of the brain. Here's the brain stem. And you can see the gray spinal cord coming out of the brain, traveling through the cervical spine. These are the vertebrae. There are seven vertebrae in the cervical spine. So C2, C3, C4, et cetera, C4 cervical. And between the vertebrae are the discs. These black structures here are the discs. And you can see right here, there's a large disc herniation, meaning the jelly, the cartilage in the inside of the disc busted through the outer layer of that disc and then herniated into the spinal canal and compressing on that spinal cord. So that was the reason why this patient was starting to lose hand function and lose equilibrium. So the condition is called cervical myelopathy. Myelopathy comes from the, from the root myelo, from Greek myelos, which means white matter. And then pathy from Greek pathia, meaning the, the act of suffering or the state of disease. So myelopathy is dysfunction or disease of the cervical spinal cord. So the clinical presentation here is this patient um, experienced upper extremity numbness, weakness and clumsiness in the hands, dropping objects, gait instability, now needing a cane. Eventually she would have needed a walker than a wheelchair if left untreated. And then in very late stages, the patients can experience urinary incontinence. So you can see here, normal MRI, look at the spinal cord, uh, completely open. And the, the way that you know that this opens, you can see this white spinal fluid signal traveling all the way down with that spinal cord versus this is a diseased spine. You can see large disc herniations right here at C3, 4, and C4, 5 that are compressing on the spinal cord at these two levels. 
So in this case, um, obviously she was getting worse. So we talked about moving forward with surgery and we moved forward pretty quickly. And what she needed was a single level disc replacement. It's a procedure where you make an incision right in the front of the neck. It takes about 45 minutes to an hour. You go in with a microscope, you remove the entire disc and the fragment here that's compressed on the spinal cord. And in her case, I was able to do a disc replacement. So I was able to put an implant to replace the disc uh, which is a mobile implant. So it allows you to maintain full range of motion. So this x-ray right here in the middle is the patient extending, looking upwards. You can see there's five degrees of lordosis, meaning an upward angulation. And then with flexing forward, there's nine degrees of kyphosis, meaning forward angulation, uh, which shows the maintenance of range of motion for this patient. So uh, she ended up going home the same day, had a significant improvement in her neurologic function. This is what a disc replacement looks like when you look at it straight on with a, with a neck x-ray. So here's the jaw and the face. Here's the upper chest, and right here is the uh, cervical spine. All right, this is case number two, another very common case to so our bread and butter spine surgery. This is a 72 year old male, comes in with two years of progressive, two years of progressive low back pain. The pain goes down to the buttocks, down the thighs, becomes worse with standing and walking, feels better with sitting down and leaning forward. Now he's at the point where he needs a walker to ambulate, not because he has weakness but just because he can't tolerate the pain, it forces him to bend forward. So this is a very typical scenario for lumbar stenosis. So lumbar stenosis is the equivalent of myelopathy in the neck. However, the difference here is that you don't have a spinal cord in your lumbar spine, if you remember that from previous slides. You only have nerves in your lumbar spine. So because of this, it's not a dangerous condition. There's no urgency to operate on these patients and they can live with this for a very long time. But this is typical for what lumbar stenosis looks like. You can see here, the lumbar vertebrae L2 through L5 and S1 is the first vertebra in the sacrum, which is, is your sit bone. Um, you can see the nerves right here, the gray nerves are open because you can see the white signal next to it. And when I come down here between L4 and L5, you see there's no white signal. And these are the cross sections. This is the cross section for L2, L3. Look at that white circle with all these gray dots. That white circle is the sac of nerves right here, right in the spinal canal. And you can see every single nerve individually versus L4, L5 you don't see the white, you don't see the nerves individually because those nerves are being compressed and they're being compressed because look at this facet joint. This is the facet joint right here. The joint line is right here and look at how big this joint is compared to the joint at L2, L3. This is a much smaller joint because it's a normal size joint. This is a disease joint because it's gotten bigger over time. It's hypertrophied over time and it's grown into the spinal canal and compressing the nerves. So this is very typical for lumbar stenosis. Um, here's another example, you can see nerves they're wide open, working out in a patient with severe lumbar stenosis, the nerves are completely compressed. And this is a typical picture for the pain they have. They have severe back pain and the pain shoots down the buttocks and the thighs. Okay, so this is the actual case that I wanna go through. So what we have here is we're looking at an, at an AP, a, a front, a front uh, facing image of the lumbar spine. Uh, you can see the L5, L4, L3, L2 vertebrae. And this is the sideways view. So we're looking here sideways. Here's the sacrum. Here, this right here is L5. This is L4. This is L3 and this is L2. So we're looking at it sideways. Okay, this is with the patient bending forward and the one on the right in extension is the patient looking upwards. So for those of you who have looked at x-rays for one reason or another in the past may notice that the vertebrae actually, they don't line up, they don't stack up. So if I drew the back of the vertebrae, so every vertebra is square shaped. And I drew the back of the vertebrae, you'll see that this vertebra here at L5 does not match up with L4 because L4 has slipped forward on L5. And if you look here at the MRI, you can see the nerves are wide open at L3 and L4, but between L4 and L5, you don't see any white signal, meaning the nerves are being severely compressed. And the back of L4 does not line up with the, with the back of L5. So that tells me two things. Number one, the nerves are being compressed. Number two, their slippage. The L4 vertebra is unstable. It's slipping forward. Every time the patient stands up, that L4 vertebra is slipping forward. And every time they lay down, it retracts backwards. And you can see here at L4, L5, there's severe compression. You don't see that white signal inside the spinal canal. So this patient failed all sorts of non-surgical measures, physical therapy, medications, went for some epidural injections. And eventually we got to the point where we have to talk about surgery. And the surgery here is number one, you have to do a lumbar laminectomy. So if you look at the image here, what you do is you cut the posterior portion of the spinal arch to open up and decompress the nerves. But because that vertebra is slipping, we also have to stabilize it because if you don't stabilize it, it'll continue to slip. And this is what this image looked like. I removed the disc, 
replaced it with a cage. So these, these hatch marks that you see here are little metallic hatch marks that are inside the cage. So you can see it on the x-ray. The cage is filled with bone graft. So that bone graft here will fuse, will grow into the bone above and below. That's what a fusion is over time. And then the screws and the rods are there just to stabilize it for the few months while the body fuses those vertebrae together. So this is a very typical lumbar decompression and fusion for someone who has lumbar stenosis. <clears throat> These are some of the other um, procedures that I do. Now, this is not so much bread and butter. This is more the sort of practice that I have at Washington Hospital Center just because I see these types of complex patients. But this is a very typical patient that I'll see. She had a fusion several years ago at another hospital. And remember how I told you about the curvatures in the spine, how they sort of balance each other out? Well, look at her lower back. You see how it's pretty flat? Well, it's not supposed to be flat. She, was, she, she had a flat lower back and because of that, she was not able to stand upright anymore. This is her trying to stand up straight. I asked her to try as hard as she could to stand up straight. And you can see she simply can't. Her head is up here. Her hips are over here. So she's not balanced. She's not in an energy efficient state. She's spending so much energy trying to lift herself up that it's, it's, and it, it causes severe back pain and an inability to maintain upright posture. So she needed a complete uh, reconstruction. I had to go back and take the screws and rods out. Um, cut her spine in multiple places, reconstruct it with these big angled, we call lordotic cages to reconstruct the curvature in her spine. I had to extend her up a little bit more. But you can see now after her reconstruction, I've recreated the curvature in her lower back. And what's interesting, if you look here, her lower back was flat, her upper back was also flat. After the surgery, I gave her the curvature back in her lower back and look, she regained the curvature naturally in her upper back because she was much more balanced. And that's her, uh, these are her before and after pictures. So a very typical kind of case that I do from a deformity standpoint. Uh, this is also um, some of the more complex um, pathology that I see at Washington Hospital Center. This is a patient that came in a few years ago and uh, had a previous trauma to his spine. You can see here the screws and the hardware from the previous trauma that he had uh, about seven, eight years ago. He ended up being a, a paraplegic because of it, but he ended up developing a very nasty infection in his, in his spine. So. You can see here, this is the T9 vertebra. You can see here how it's square shaped. And all of a sudden in this portion of the spine, you don't see anything that looks anything remotely close like a vertebra because the infection completely destroyed this portion of the spine. And you can see here, the lower part of the spine is no longer aligned with the upper part of the spine. So I had to go in and completely clean out the infection. Something like this, you can't really clean it out with one, um, with, with one surgical procedure. He ended up needing to go back to the operating room several times to keep, to keep cleaning out the margins of the infection. Once we finally got it clean, then I reconstructed, I placed a cage to uh, support that aspect of the spine and realign him and then extended the screws and rods above and below to get him more balanced. So this is what it looks like before and this is what it looks like after. Um, this is also another deformity case. This was an adolescent. Uh, she was uh, 20 years old, so just past adolescence. And she had a pretty significant scoliosis that she was not able to get treated when she was younger. So she has a 59 degree curve here. And the rule of thumb for scoliosis, 45 degrees and above, you tend to fuse. 40 degrees and below, you can probably watch them because they don't progress over time. So she came with a 59 degree curvature, which 59 degrees is not a problem when you're 20 years old, but it becomes a problem when you're 65 years old when that 59 degrees becomes 85 degrees or 100 degrees, it starts to affect lung function. So. Um, you can also see here that her rib cage is rotated. You can see the, the asymmetry in her, uh, in her right uh, thorax versus her left thorax. And you can see her shoulders are slanted and clinically that's how she presented. So I took her to the operating room and loosened up her spine by making certain cuts, put the screws and rods to realign her spine and make her as close to upright as possible. And you can see here her shoulders, even that quite a bit and look at her rib cage now very nice and symmetric. And uh, clinically she also corrected quite nicely. So those are some of the common cases that I, I uh, tend to see at Washington Hospital Center. And uh, like I said, half my practice, I do a lot of minimally invasive uh, procedures through the tubes and with a microscope, but uh, they're not quite so easy to show on the x-ray. So I showed some of the more complex uh, procedures so we can go through some before and after pictures. So let's see here, should I, should I stop sharing my screen so we can go to video mode or should I keep it here for, screen mode. You can uh, definitely keep it here in case our students want to write it down or look in their phones for your social media. Thank you for providing that. I just wanted to ask a question. Some students have been direct messaging me and asking if they'd like to have access to your presentation just to review. 
So are you able to? Yes. So yeah, the 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 last part of the presentation with some of those pictures, I'm I'm gonna have to omit. But absolutely, the anything before that, it's all yours. They're more than happy. They're more than welcome to review that and keep it. Thank you so much. So let's move on to our questions. That was an amazing presentation. Thank you for giving it to us and taking the time to uh, speak on that. Um, for one of our questions, Nefertari asks, how do med school admissions really view non-traditional applicants? So very favorably, actually. I would say my med school class was probably 60 to 70% traditional. And you know maybe two thirds traditional, one third non traditional, and I'll tell you the non traditional students in general did just as good, if not a little bit better than the traditional students. They were more focused. They had a stronger plan. They knew what they wanted. They had more life experience. So if you're non traditional, do not at all get discouraged by it. Uh, I want I want you to embrace it. Work on your strength and that on your strengths and displaying your strengths and just know that you can do it. Um, that being said. Scores are important, Te you know, test scores are important, um, grades are important, letters of recommendations are important uh, because it, it's still, it's an objective marker that uh, admissions committees are able to look at. But at the same time, if you have something unique about you that's, you know, in, in the non-traditional track, then uh, by all means, it's, you know, that's the time to sort of showcase it while you're going through the application process. Awesome, thank you. Um... Liam asks, did being trilingual help you pick up content during your medical education? Because no. you mentioned Spanish and French, they're Latin languages. No, not really. Being trilingual helped me communicate with patients. It helped me uh, understand my patients better. It helped me uh, appreciate culture more, especially in a very diverse uh, setting. I was in Baltimore, it was a very diverse city, and then DC, definitely. But no, didn't really help too much with uh, picking up terminology. Uh, Liam also asks um, if you would recommend pre-med students or medical students to invest in learning other languages. Um, don't do it for medicine. Don't do it for yourself. I mean, if, if, if you're really interested in learning another language, uh, if you're in the US, I would strongly recommend Spanish. It's probably the most useful language uh, on this side of the globe. Uh, do it for yourself. If you're doing it to you know for the wrong reasons you're just not going to learn it you're not going to you're not going to have that motivation when times get tough to to keep pursuing it so again be honest with yourself first that's probably the most important thing but if you if, if you have a drive to learn another language by all means you got to do it but the only way to learn it is to be consistent you have to do a little bit every day otherwise you just won't get there or you'll get there years down the road yeah, definitely. Um, an audience member mentioned that you did talk about your work-life balance and you try to prioritize your family and fitness and all of the things that you want to do outside of medicine really well. But did you ever have a time in which you prioritized work over your personal life? And how were you able to kind of get all that? All the time, done? all the time. It, it, it happened all the time when I was going through, um, when I was going through undergrad, Med school, definitely. Residency, definitely. Um, more often than not, I felt like my life was unbalanced. Uh, that being said, just like everything else in life, it's, you know, everything ebbs and flows. So if you go for a month where you feel like things are very unbalanced, well, that one weekend where you have the ability to kind of recreate that balance, it's really important that you quickly work on, on finding that balance again. So, uh, and that's part of being in a tunnel. That's the part that I, that I said where... I had to be selfish and I had to explain to my support system that I was going to go through a very selfish period in my life. Um, and so, yeah, unfortunately, that, that's part of the process. But if you're mindful of it, you will be much better at quickly recalibrating when you have the opportunity to recalibrate. But uh, all the time, I mean, when I, when I was studying for tests, when I was getting ready for uh, an interview, when I was you know, preparing for that next step and this may not mean too much for you now. It, it, it's easier once you've sort of gotten out of the tunnel, but the hardest part is getting to that next step, right? The hardest part is studying for the test so you can get a good uh, set of grades that semester. And then once that semester's over, it's actually life's not that hard, right? The hardest part is getting to med school. Once you get into med school, it's not as hard as the process of getting into med school. The hardest part is getting to residency program. Once you're in residency, the actual residency experience is not as hard as what it took to get there. So once you're there, you're on a track, you're in a pathway, you're in a tunnel, you have a program that's designed to help you succeed. But the hardest part is getting there. So 
I forget where I was. Um, I think I, I heard this on TV and I think it's a Colin Powell thing, but I could be totally wrong on this, but the concept is intense engagement. Life tends to happen in spurts of intense engagement. So you can go for weeks where things are pretty chill. And all of a sudden you have that one week where it's time to study for your finals, cram, you have to disappear, study for 15 hours a day, and then you do hopefully well, and then life goes back to being normal. So it's really important to prepare for those moments of intense engagement, but at the same time, be also prepared to quickly reverse once that period is over. Thank you for that answer. So Sailor is asking if you've ever heard of the Schroth method for scoliosis. It's kind of like a physical therapy exercise and it's meant to kind of get the curved spine back into a normal position. What are your thoughts on that since it's a non-surgical method? So I, I don't know specifically about the Schroth method, but for curvatures that are small, meaning 15 to 20 degrees or less, um, you may not be able to reverse the curve necessarily, but what's really important is by strengthening your paraspinal muscles, by keeping your core strong and flexible, you can potentially prevent that curve from progressive, progressing any further. But more importantly, it's not, you know, if you have a curve that's in the 20s or 30s, you're not really going to have any significant long-term consequences from that. The, the chance of that curve progressing is very low, but you could have some chronic pains because of the muscle imbalance. So keeping a strong core can help a lot with preventing those pains down the road. Uh, as far as I know, the only thing that has been shown to maybe reverse if you're young enough and then prevent the curve from progressing is bracing and specifically bracing for uh, more than uh, 20 hours a day uh, and specifically during that growth spurt um, of adolescence. But other than that, I don't know of any data out there that has shown any other physical therapy or chiropractic methods that uh, can slow down or reverse the curvature. Okay, um, Shivanji asks, how did you prepare for India interviews and how did you deal with the anxiety and getting nervous? Practice over and over and over and film yourself. The hardest thing to do is to watch yourself on tape. It's so hard. It's so hard. I had, a, actually, I was lucky. I had a decent pre-med advisor when I was at Emory in the sense that he didn't discourage me from anything. Uh, he you know, even though he knew the, what the process was like, he always encouraged me just to kind of chase uh, my ambition. And when the time came, I think it was uh, two or three months before my first, before interview season started, uh, I went to his office. We did a 45 minute practice sessions. You know, it's, I mean, the questions are the same questions uh, for the most part, you can find them online. And I watched myself on tape and we actually watched it together and he just critiqued me. I mean, he critiqued every part of my interview process, how I was sitting, how I was using my hands, I was projecting my voice, uh, stuttering, mumbling, speaking too fast, which I tend to do if you guys haven't noticed already. So it's really hard to watch yourself on tape, but that's the, that's the only way to do it. Now it's, it's so easy. Everyone has a, has a camera on their phone. So that is, it, it's painful, but you got to do it because the more you practice ahead of time, the more relaxed you're going to be in the interview session, because now instead of being distracted with the interview setting, you're going to have the mental bandwidth to actually think about your answer. And especially when they, when they ask you something that you are uncomfortable answering, right? For me, it was, did you ever read? My answer was no. My answer wasn't just no, it was no, but this is why I didn't read, right? So you can always take a tough question that may, that may make you look bad and spin it and turn it into something very positive, right? So that's the art of interviewing. Uh, but you don't get to that level of uh, comfort in the interview setting if you haven't practiced over and over again and specifically with the hard answers. So I would strongly suggest that you find a pre-med advisor, find someone who's been through the process already, find a friend who's going through the same thing and just keep practicing because you know, it, it, doesn't take, uh, it doesn't take you know a dean of admissions to know what a good answer is versus a bad answer, right? We can all kind of figure out what that good or bad answer is when we're critiquing someone else. So have someone watch you and critique you and then watch yourself. Thank you for that helpful tip. Um, Romerica asks, how do you ask for help as a full-fledged doctor when patients rely you on for answers and they think that you know everything? Yeah, so the Dean of Admissions, uh, rest in peace, uh, Dr. Mickey Foxwell, University of Maryland, he's a fantastic person. When I was on the admissions committee, he said over and over again, probably the single-handed most important 
quality that he looked for in a pre-med student was the ability to ask for help. I can't stress that enough. We're all, we all get in trouble constantly, especially when you're going through something very rigorous and very stressful. You have to be okay admitting your weaknesses. You have to be okay asking for help. You have to be okay going to your teacher. Um, gosh, I mean, I had a psychology course in college where it was, it was three tests. It was, a, it was a, like a sort of mid-course uh, mid test, a, a midterm test, and a final test. And my first test, I got a 35% on the test. And I was like, oh my God, what's going on? So I started going to his office every single day after class and just making sure that my notes were better and that I understood the concept. And I ended up getting like a 98% on the next test and I got a 94% on the final. But that didn't happen because I suddenly changed my studying habits. It happened because I went and asked him for help and recruited him. Actually, he became one of my greatest mentors and wrote me an incredible letter of recommendation. So I can't stress that enough. Recruit mentors be humble, um, you know, that it, it's a dangerous place when you're not comfortable asking for help. And even today in my career, I'd say, you know, I, I do very complex things at least once a month. I'm picking up the phone, calling my mentors in San Diego, calling my friends here in Washington, DC who are spine surgeons who also train in a very complex uh, uh, deformity centers across the country. And I'll say, hey, what do you think? What would you do for this? You know, this is what I'm thinking. And sometimes just verbalizing it with someone that can help you kind of go back and forth the, the right answer will present itself. So I can't stress that enough. It's so important. Thank you for that answer. Another question from Asal. He asks, how many medical schools do you recommend to apply for? And he also wants to know, how did you study for the MCAT specifically mm -hmm. regarding the comprehension? Of it? Mm. So I don't know the answer anymore in terms of how many medical schools to apply for. I think uh, and, and I honestly can't remember at the time how many I applied to. I remember I applied to a lot. And I think it was on the order of like 20 to 30 medical schools. And then, you know, once I started getting the secondaries, I remember just having to spend so much time, like just writing essays for secondary applications. Um, so I don't know what that answer is. And I think it depends on your scores, uh, your test scores, your grades, et cetera. So I would say probably best to talk to an advisor about that number. Um, the second part of the question, I struggled with reading comprehension. Like I really struggled. Um, I remember when I was studying for the SATs, I got, I got a really strong math score. And then I, I took it again and I spent three months doing nothing but reading comprehension. My math score went up, even though I didn't even study for math the second time around and my reading comprehension score went down. So the only thing that I could do was just to go through those vignettes over and over again, right? Like that, the paragraph that you read where you have to answer the questions on reading comprehension. And I, I did okay. Like it just was, it wasn't my strength. Thankfully, science for me uh, strengthened my overall score. And it was, you know, it was a topic of conversation when my interviews came up. I mean, they, they asked me all the time, you know, how come your reading comprehension score wasn't as strong as your science score? And you just have to answer it honestly. And, um, but that's okay because there are a lot of physicians out there. And very likely the physician who's going to be interviewing, you or the person interviewing for medical school may have been in the same boat. So just practice. You got to keep practicing. I did do I did do a Kaplan uh, I think a Kaplan or Princeton review I did one of those review courses for the MCAT and I think I took two months off in the summer before my senior year and just did nothing but study for the MCAT and it was like the one thing that I focused and I went and sat in my parents basement and just eliminated all distractions so again you have to go through those periods of very intense engagement uh, before uh, the dust settles so you can move on with your life. Yeah, thank you for that advice. Um, another question Yogita asks, being a super introverted person myself, I find it really hard to go up and engage in conversation. What tips do you have for interviewing skills or just asking for mentorship and networking, just communicating with people that you don't know? Yeah, so most physicians are introverted. I mean, I'm, I'm a very introverted person at baseline. It took me years, years to become more comfortable with just approaching strangers and you know, learning how to say, hi, how are you? Back in the days before COVID, shake hands. Um, and I would say you, you kind of had to practice that one too. Now for the interview, it doesn't matter because you can practice the interview setting and end up feeling comfortable in the interview setting. So just because you're introverted doesn't mean that you're going to do poorly on the interview. In fact, the only thing that's going to make you uh, succeed on the interview is your ability to practice and prepare for that one specific social engagement. That's that. But 
other than that, in terms of recruiting mentors, um, you know, there's most, especially in medicine, uh, because medicine is a sort of track where we all had mentors, we all went through the process. And in general, I think most physicians enjoy mentoring up and coming pre-med students, enjoy mentoring up and coming physicians. That's just, I think that's just sort of our, like our, our, benevolent, our, benevolent, our benevolent nature as physicians. I had quite a few physicians just kind of flat out not be interested in mentoring me. And some that were in my culture, right? Like somewhere I felt like, wait a second, like I'm Lebanese, they're Lebanese. How come they're not interested in being my mentor? I mean, that happened a handful of times and initially it was discouraging. And then I realized, you know what? Got to move on. Who cares? And I was very surprised to find out that those that I thought were not going to be as interested in mentoring me actually became my greatest mentors. So you have to ask. I mean, that, that's the thing is that there's nothing wrong. Someone is saying, hey, would you mind mentoring me? There's nothing wrong, you know, it's especially if you have a geographical connection to them or they're part of your institution or, you know, it's some it's someone where you can stop by their office. Uh, I mean, that's every single mentor that I recruited. I, I asked them, I said, hey, would you be willing to mentor me? And, um, you know, you, you also have to be respectful of that mentor's time. So I had, you know, for all the mentors that I recruited, it was a very specific thing that I needed help in or help with. And, you know, it was, it was usually a five or 10 minute conversation here, five, minute, ten, five or 10 minute conversation there, maybe a lunch uh, here and there. So you have to be very specific with what you're going and asking your mentor for. Uh, because if you're going to ask them for mentorship, they're also going to expect something back from you, which is adherence to that mentorship and respect for that mentorship. Too. Thank you. Um, Izijia Maka asks, what would you tell a person who is interested in medicine but has other professions in mind? Choosing a career can be tough and the fear of choosing wrong can be even tougher. So she's mm -hmm. asking, how do you know that medicine is for them? Um, yeah, that's a tough one. So for me, I was really interested in finance. I, uh, I loved the stock market in high school. I was a uh, finance minor in undergrad. And so I definitely explored that with the idea of, well, maybe I can go to Wall Street and just kind of be a finance guy. And every time I got closer to finance, I found myself being pulled back towards pre-med. And that's just sort of how I knew, you know, it's, uh, you, know, you can think of it as like dating, right? Like you're, you're dating these subject matters and you have to kind of spend a little bit of time with this subject, subject matter, see how you feel, see what the vision looks like, talk to people in that field, then go back to the other subject matter, kind of see how you feel, talk to people in that field. Over time, the right answer will present itself. Um, and then at the end of the day, if all else is equal, and you can be just as happy doing medicine and just happy doing something else. Well, then you have to take into consideration everything else around it, right? Am I, what, what has a better lifestyle? What has less training? What has uh, fewer uh, student loans? And so you have to kind of take all that into account. I will say, if you're passionate about medicine, you're going to have a phenomenal career. You're going to have an incredible career. You're going to be so passionate about what you do. The, the, the field's always changing. There are frustrations, obviously. There are tons of frustrations. And like I said, you're not going to become a bazillionaire but you will always find a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of happiness in what you do. So, um, you know, that was, I've, me in retrospect, I definitely made the right decision as, as hard as I feel like I work sometimes. Absolutely, appreciate the insight. Um, Rebecca is asking, have you met someone who went from RN, BSN to MD or OT to MD, like any other uh, people who've had like a certain profession and they moved to MD and would you recommend this? Do med schools look down upon this? No, they definitely don't look down. So I think you have to think about it as, um, as an investment, right? Is it, you already basically have a career. Is it worthwhile for you to kind of stop your career in its tracks and then go back and reinvest your time to pivot into, into, med, into medicine? If you're passionate about it, absolutely that's the right answer for you but if you're not totally passionate about it and it's sort of like an idea that you would you know in theory like to pursue well you know you have to understand that it's going to be a multiple year process where you 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 went from having a career to now accruing student debt and going back into the tunnel if you will um but again you know times are changing i mean my 
um, you know, my, my parents' generation, they were retiring at the age of 65, right? And then living their quote unquote golden years till they were in their 80s or 90s. Now, you know, our generation, especially your generation, because you guys are, most of you are uh, guys and gals and uh, are at least 10 to 15 years younger than me, you will live till you're 90 plus and you will live till you're 90 plus and be healthy. So you have to think about your time frame has shifted compared to the traditional time frame that, you know, we grew up um, um, thinking about. So uh, don't feel like you're pigeonholed. So if it's your passion, definitely pursue it. And for sure, you will not be looked down upon. In fact, it's a strength to have another specialty ahead of time. You, that, that, that's the non-traditional part that I think a lot of uh, pre-med uh, med school programs uh, appreciate that you had some kind of experience uh, before med school. An audience member is asking about your experiences as a professor and uh, how can you talk about the dynamics of being a professor and also like also being a doctor in the, in the clinical sense and um, yeah so so in, in the academic track so I'm an assistant professor at Georgetown so in the academic track uh, the academic appointment that I have as an assistant professor is one where I teach the residents so it's actually it's part of my workflow it's part of my every day so every Tuesday morning I give a lecture to the residents they're in the operating room either learning in the operating room obviously very uh, uh, very responsibly and very gradually but they're there you know you, they're there to learn and to watch and to participate and so that's how, that's the academic appointment that I have so it's not the type of academic appointment where I'm giving medical school lectures once or twice a week. It's not like that at all. So I may give a medical school lecture once a year, once every couple of years, but uh, my, I, I'm teaching the residents while I'm practicing. Okay, thank you for that insight. Um, Jenny asks, at first, were you ever nervous or scared observing the insides of a human body? Now you probably do it all the time, but what was your first reaction when you had like a a cadaver in front of you, yeah. um, were you you were, so, were you not shocked? So mo most medical schools will put you in front of the cadaver very early. And I think your first week of medical school for most places in the US will put you in the cadaver lab that, during that first week. And yeah, it's hard. I mean, the our cadavers at University of Maryland, they kept the head covered for the first month and a half just to let us get comfortable with the, with, with the dissections of the body. And then uh, it was like six weeks later, I think when we, when we unveiled the head to start doing the um, uh, the, uh, the facial dissections and the, uh, the, the brain dissections, et cetera. Um, and the neck dissections as well. So yeah, it's hard. It's just like anything else. You, you get used to it. I'd say the first day in cadaver lab, everyone is putting was double gloving and being really careful by your second week in cadaver lab, you're taking your Coke into the lab. You know, you've got your lunchbox next to you. It becomes a very natural thing, uh, a very respectful thing. Cause you, at, at the end of the day, you, you know, they always remind you that this is this is a human body that you have to respect um, and be appreciative of. But you just you, you just become a bit more relaxed, and maybe you're not double gloving anymore. You're doing a single glove, and um, just like anything else, it's, it's like the first time you got in a car and the first time you drove, you were super nervous. The next thing you know, you're parallel parking with your eyes closed. Or you know, I'm, I'm using that as an example, but uh, don't be afraid of it. Accept the process because you're going to get there. Definitely, I agree with that. Um, because I think you've been part of the medical school committee, we've gotten a lot of questions from our audience members regarding like how medical sc schools view certain conditions and things. And one of our audience members, Sarah asks, how do you, how do you as well as medical schools feel about gap years? Is it okay to take more than one if you are making the best out of them and trying to work on your growth as a person? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with the gap year at all but you, you have to explain why you took that gap year. I mean, you know, if, if you took the gap year because, um, I don't know, you wanted to go party in Europe for a year, well, it's gonna be a lot harder to explain that gap year, but again, you can always spin things, right? So if you took, if you went and partied in Europe for a year during your gap year, you know, you spun it and you said that you wanted to explore this or explore that and did culture diving and started a blog and you know started an Instagram page because of it, right? So you have to kind of have something to show for that gap year and show that there was something productive that came out of it. But uh, again, you have to put on your spin master hat when you're interviewing, because there's always a way to spin something positively. Uh, so don't, you know, we tend to focus on the negative, right? Because we're anxious about how we're gonna answer that question. But understand that that person who's interviewing you, they're meeting you for the first time. 
So you are 100% in control of how you present that answer. I'm not saying be dishonest, not at all. But again, there's, there's, there's always, right? There's always two sides to every story, right? Anyone who's ever gotten in a fight with someone else, right? There's always two sides to every story. And so the, the art of spinning is not being dishonest. It's just spinning that question to highlight the strengths and distract from the weaknesses of that question or that answer. Um, Varsha asks, does it take a lot of energy and strength to fix the spine since you need to arrange the tools and strength straighten the spine? Yeah, so for, for some of those bigger cases that I showed you, the big deformity cases, they're very physically rigorous because you're, you're standing up for five, six, seven hours, you're bending forward over the spine. So absolutely, I, I think for me, having a strong core um, and just staying in, in just basic shape uh, has made a huge difference in my life. And it's still, I mean, I, I walk out of the OR some days and I'm stiff. I'm so stiff. I have to come home and I, the first thing I do is I get on the roller, I get into my yoga poses. I just, I stretch for 10, 15 minutes as soon as I get home. Um, and it takes me sometimes a couple of days to kind of feel like I've gotten my flexibility back. But again, I'm not doing, you know, seven, eight hour cases every day. I'm doing them, you know, once a week, once, you know, once every couple of weeks, most of the surgeries are three or four hours long. And, you know, you have time in between to go for a quick stretch or a quick walk around the hospital, et cetera. Yeah. It seems like it's a whole workout in and of itself. Yeah. Sometimes it can be. Sari asks, what are the best extracurriculars for med school applications? Um, so again, th there's no right or wrong answer here. I think you want, you want extracurriculars to show that you are well-rounded, that you're thinking outside the box, that you have worked to improve yourself as a person, uh, as a human being, and that show that you are interested in medicine and are trying to get prepared to go to medical school. So if you don't have any extracurriculars that, sh that display you're interested in medicine, that's gonna be a bit of a red flag. They're gonna wonder why you're actually applying to medical school. Is this something that you really want? Because someone who really wants to become a physician, well, they're gonna do things that are gonna put them in that position to become a, a physician. So um, any extracurricular is better than nothing, but they also, you know, there's no wrong, right or wrong extracurricular, but you have to be a bit targeted with it. So shout, you know, like, you know, what you're doing now is obviously great. You know, you're, you're, you know, you've displayed interest in doing uh, online shadowing and you know, even during the COVID pandemic where, you know, shadowing physically is no longer possible, but hopefully once things open up, try to shadow as much as you can, try to get involved with any types of projects. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's like, it's, it's like the, the, the theory of the energy of the universe. If you put that energy out there, it will come back to you in return. So if you display interest, I promise you the opportunities will present themselves. Thank you. A couple of uh, students have been asking a question related to this concept of family and having significant others and mm -hmm. um, having them understand that you are in an intense journey and it's a lot of work mentally and just physically always being at the clinic or at school. So some students are asking, how do you get around to, to your family or your significant other about how your life is like so intense and you might not be able to give them time? Yeah. So I mean, I don't know if I'm the best person. I never had a significant other. I mean, I, I dated when I was going through the process, but never like, you know, I was never married and, you know, in, in, a, in that sort of relationship where I, you know, I never had kids where I had very strong forces that were pulling me away from, you know, my selfish mm -hmm. track. Uh, my parents, thankfully, were very understanding of the process. So I don't know if I'm the best person to answer that question. That being said, I have a lot of friends who, met their significant others early on in their medical school journey and went through the ups and the downs of that relationship. So I would say two things. Number one, you have to be humble in the sense that, like I said, understand that you're going to be emotionally stunted. Number one. Number two, understand that you're going to be selfish. And number three, if that relationship is important to you, and I'm assuming if you're asking the question, it's important to you, um, you have to as much as you can find a way to bridge that gap because there's always gonna be a gap, right? The gap is gonna be the pull of your attention towards that really hard thing that you're trying to accomplish and the pull of that significant other's needs. And there's always that gap, but as much as you can, you have to try to bridge that gap. And I will say my friends who went through that process, once the, once the tunnel, once they were out of the tunnel, 
now that they're older, they have kids, they're established. Uh, the one thing that they all say is looking back, that ability to survive that gap with that significant other became the strongest bond that they had. Because if you can get past this, you will get past anything else in life. So, you know, in a way, it's not just training. If you have a significant other, it's not just training for you to become a professional. It's also training for you to become a better partner uh, in life with that significant other. So, you know, use that, you know, maybe take that challenge and take that difficulty as a positive and try to spin it into something that, you know, will make you a better person. Uh, but um, I think for me, seeing my friends who succeeded at it, they were very honest and they were very humble and they were very loving and they tried to, as much as they could, put their pride to the side and their selfishness to the side uh, in that setting of being a better significant other for, the, for their partners. But take the, you know, whatever it's worth from the guy who was single. Thank you for that insight regardless. Did you have any other last advice for our pre-medical students? Um, try, try to enjoy the journey, try to enjoy the process. It's easier said than done, but for those of you who have ever traveled, I mean, this is probably the best example that I can give you. For those of you who've ever traveled, and I'm not talking about, you know, taking a leisurely trip to a resort. I'm talking about like traveling where you don't really know where you're going to stay. You're not really sure what the next train is going to be. You don't know if you're going to stay in a hostel or right. That discomfort of traveling where you're not quite sure what that next step is going to be, where you're, you know, maybe you don't understand the language in that other country. Um, you always come out of those experiences stronger smarter, better, wiser. And so there's never any growth without being uncomfortable, right? So the more, the more you push yourself outside your comfort zone, the more and the faster you're gonna grow. So as much as you can, if you're mindful of that while you're going through the journey, right? That night before the test when it's 2 a.m. and you just wanna kind of put your hands up and just say, you know, just give up. Understand that that's gonna, when you come out of that experience, you're going to be a better version of yourself. And so in a way, appreciate those moments because you'll look back one day and say, wow, I'm so glad I had all these challenging experiences. I became a better version of myself. Thank you so much for your awesome presentation. I know I learned a lot myself and I'm sure so many other students did too. If you look in the chat, so many people are saying thank you to uh, having you spend your time. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We'd love, we, we'd love having you. So I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen so we can have our wrap up presentation. Um, first of all, from that informative presentation, if you guys wanted to reflect, uh, we have three questions at Pre-Health Shadowing asking what brought you here to the session today? What are three major takeaways you got and what do you want to learn more about? These aren't required, but it's just to document your thoughts during the live session and maybe use it for your future applications if you uh, had something really significant taking away from our live session. If you'd like to publish it as a review of our live session or wanted to go in more depth and write an article, a reflection, or a success story about medical topics, sociology, med life, and anything you'd like to write about related to health and medicine, you can submit your thoughts today on today's session and more at www.prehealthshadowing.com slash blog submissions. I'm the editor-in-chief, and I'd really love for you guys to write something and for me to read your submissions. If you want to learn more about pre-health shadowing and get involved in our program, we have some awesome team members and opportunities to lead volunteers and large groups of people. So you can definitely visit our website and to submit a team member application. We also have asynchronous hours for volunteers who don't have a, a schedule where they can fit so many things. So you can definitely volunteer asynchronously at your own time and get certified volunteer hours. We are, all, we are also accepting team member applications beside that, so you can choose which path you'd like to take and definitely sign up. Once again, we are humbly asking that if you're financially able to donate, that you do please consider uh, having a few dollars because we have a lot of programs running and our website and to keep all of them running, we really do need money. So if you are able to afford it or know someone else who can, please uh, send them our Venmo information and our GoFundMe information. 
Um, other than that, please uh, do spread the word about pre-health shadowing so we can reach as many students as possible. During the pandemic, a lot of shadowing opportunities for health professionals are low because of the pandemic. So uh, sharing our program would be really meaningful to a lot of people. So now for the part we've all been waiting for, how to earn a digital certificate for the virtual shadowing hours. So first you will be going onto our website and finding our professionals course pages. In this case, our professional was Dr. Oliver Tanis. After you find his course page, you can take our quick 10 question multiple choice quiz. This quiz is based on the content from today's session and you will have 30 minutes per attempt once you open the session. You have to earn a 70% or higher. This means getting seven out of 10 right, at least on the assessment in order to earn your certificate. We know that sometimes tech can be difficult, so we have two attempts. Once you open one of the attempts, you have 30 minutes. These quizzes are open indefinitely, so you are able to take them today, tomorrow, next week, or next month at your leisure, but you have two attempts once you open them and 30 minutes. Once you have passed, you can click the finish course button at the bottom of the professionals page and download your certificate, which verifies your virtual shadowing hours for today. If you happen to miss a part of the session due to internet or anything else and just wanna go back and refresh your mind, you are able to view our session on our YouTube page and our professional pages on our website. Uh, you are able to take any assessments from the previous session. You can browse our YouTube page. We have so many wonderful, speakers there from OTs to medical doctors and PAs. So be sure to check those uh, uh, things out at our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel is Free Health Shattering. Be sure to follow us on our social media and subscribe to our email list. We are active on TikTok and Instagram. And with our upcoming sessions coming up, you definitely don't want to miss them. We are booked every day, every weekday until June for virtual shadowing sessions. So I hope to see you guys there and be sure to be on the lookout for our future sessions. Thank you so much for joining us today and please stick around if you have any questions for myself or other team members, we will be happy to answer them. The shadowing session is officially over and I invite you all to log off. Have a wonderful day, evening, morning. Thank you for being here.